Today I will tell you, I will, uh, I will tell you about uh, a tool that we've been developing, developing in the group. Uh, so as, uh, as Amin said, I'm, uh, I'm um, currently doing a postdoc in the lab of Richard Nair here in, uh, here in Basel. Um, and yeah, I will tell you about this tool, Pangraph, that we've been develop developing uh, that uh, it's, it can be used to represent uh, basically genomes or plasmid as, as graphs. So, um, okay. Um, so to introduce it a bit, let's say that I have a set of isolates, maybe of plasmids that contain some cassette that maybe provides antimicrobial resistance. Uh, and I'm interested in studying the, the evolution and the spread of, of such resistance. There are different ways in which I could go about it. So one could be maybe stratifying my sample by presence and absence of, uh, of the resistance cassette. But then I could also take the sequence of my cassette and try to, to align it and see variation uh, amongst the isolate, maybe to study sequence evolution. Um, and then since most uh, since many of these cassettes are, are kind of mobile, I also might be interested in knowing where this cassette integrates inside the broader context of, uh, of a genome or where it is placed inside, the, inside of a plasmid. And uh, what we've been interested in is kind of finding a representation that allows one to ask meaning, meaningful questions on, on all of these levels. And uh, a very natural one is uh, the pangenome graph. Um, so what is a pangenome graph? Uh, let's say that I have a set of, uh, a set of assembled uh, chromosome, maybe assembled bacterial uh, chromosome, or maybe plasmids uh, that I want to compare. So here, in this case, I have uh, five isolates, A, B, C, D, E. And part of their sequence is homologous. So here I color the homologous sequence with, uh, with the same color. Uh, I want to build a representation in which uh, homologous sequences are grouped as uh, as kind of edges in, in a graph and um, isolates are represented as closed path inside of these graphs. So this representation has two main elements. One are what we call blocks. So blocks are sets of homologous sequences uh, and these have a consensus, uh, but they also contain um, variations on this consensus for each isolate. So it's really uh, information on the alignment of these homologous sequences. And then I have paths that are um, basically a representation of my, of my genomes, of my sequences as a list of blocks. So here in this case, isolate I, A is composed by block one, followed by block two, block three, block four, block five. And in my graph representation, it needs to be a closed path inside this, uh, this graph. Um, so what I will refer to as pangenome graph is this collection of blocks and paths where blocks are really alignments. So they contain information on uh, each occurrence of these homologous sequences and paths are uh, representation of these isolates as list of blocks. Um, I hope I can convince you that with this representation, one can ask meaningful question on all of these levels. So one can check whether a given uh, stretch of sequence is present or not, once you know in which block it's present. You also have the alignment that is present inside of blocks and each, for each block, you know in which context it appears. So you can kind of explore all of these dimensions. And at the same time, it's a meaningful representation also if one is interested in uh, sequence evolution on, on the broader level. For example, you can think of recent insertion level, uh, insertion events, sorry, um, as a, a new part of the sequence appearing that is not present in any other uh, isolate. And this appears in my graph as kind of a, um, a deviation from the common path uh, taken by all isolate uh, of, of, a given, uh, of a given single path. Um, in uh, what we've uh, been trying to, to develop is a tool that allows you to uh, build these representations starting from the sequences. Uh, so this is a, a work done uh, in collaboration with, uh, with Richard and, uh, and Nick. Um, we've come up with, uh, with PanGraph. This is a Julia-based library and command line interface for aligning whole genomes into a graph. So really for building this representation. Uh, this is currently available on, uh, on GitHub. And yeah, most of the 
heavy lifting has been done uh, by Nicolas Noll, who is, uh, was a postdoc here in the Centrum and now is uh, at KITP in the uh, University of California. Um, and uh, the interface of this tool is, is very simple. You, uh, given a, a set of, uh, of genomes that can be contained, for example, let's say a set of plasmids that are contained inside of a FASTA, a FASTA file, uh, once the tool is available in your path, one can simply type uh, pangraph build. So this is the command to build uh, the pangenome graph. Uh, then there's an optional flag here, minus minus circular, because uh, this signifies that the plasmids we are considering are actually circular plasmids. And one can pipe the results into a pangraph.json file. And this JSON file really will contain uh, two, two elements, a list of blocks and a list of paths. So this is what I've been, been telling you about. And uh, yeah, we also, um, there's also documentation available in which more details on how this, uh, this JSON file is organized and, um, and all of the, the function are well documented. This is also available, uh, available online. Um, so I want to tell you a bit about the algorithm that we use to build, uh, to build this representation. So starting from our set of genomes, what Pangraph does, uh, it's first of all, uh, building a guide tree. So this is uh, uh, done by using alignment-free distance. So um, in, in our case, we use a mesh to obtain a quick uh, measure of how diverse, how, how different uh, each, each uh, of these genome is from, from the other. So this allows us to build uh, in a fast way, a guide tree. And this, in these three genomes that are more similar are closer together. And then we will place each genome on a leaf of the tree as a trivial graph. So this is a graph composed of a, of a single block. And then what happens is that we'll propagate this graph along the tree and at each internal node of the tree, we will perform a merge of two graphs. And we will collect the pangenome graph at the root of the tree. And notice that this, this process, uh, this process um, uh, each of the, of the merges on the upward part of the tree is independent of the one occurring uh, afterwards. So they can be run in parallel and they are run in parallel uh, by, by Pangraph. But really the interesting part uh, is happening at this level, at the merge of two, uh, of two graphs along the tree. So I can explain you a, a bit more in detail how we, how we do this, how we merge two graphs. So you can imagine that on two branches of these trees, I'm collecting two graphs, the, the blue and the yellow one, and I want to merge them into a, a new green graph. So each of these two graphs, the blue and the yellow, will have blocks. Uh, so these are uh, what I was telling you about before, these, these uh, alignments of all homologous regions. What we do is we run a pairwise alignment of every block against each other using the consensus sequence of each block. Uh, and uh, in our case, we use Minimap2 uh, Minimap as a tool to perform the, uh, the alignment. And uh, every time we find an homologous region, um, we have to decide whether we want to merge this into, into a new block. And we do this using a pseudo energy. Every time this pseudo energy is negative, the merge will be performed. And this pseudo energy uh, goes as minus the length uh, of, the, of the alignment. So the longer the homologous region I, I was able to match, the more likely the alignment uh, is to occur. But then I also have two other terms uh, that depend and see on the number of cuts that I will perform when, uh, when merging the two, the two blocks. So you have to imagine that um, if, I, if I'm able to match a sub part of this blue block, I will have to perform cuts on the edges of the part that is alignable. So this will uh, make the graph more fragmented. And then there's a term NM that counts the number of um, mutation, basically of polymorphism that I have in my alignment. So this makes so that if the sequences are too diverse, uh, too diverse, too diverged, then they won't be merged. And one can control these parameters alpha and beta, depending on whether um, one wants more merging or uh, at, at the cost of a more fragmented graph or less merging uh, and, a more, uh, um, and a graph with, less, uh, with a smaller number of blocks. So for blocks 
for which the pseudo energy is negative, uh, merge will be performed. And in this case, a new block is created and is connected to the rest of the, of the graph as, uh, um, as given by, by the path structure. So this is really how, at the core, how PanGraph works and how PanGraph builds um, this pangenome graph representation. So talking about performances, I think the, um, the most important things I can maybe show you are uh, times for uh, aligning uh, genomes of some species. For example, here, uh, for 51 uh, genomes of mycobacterium tuberculosis. So these are chromosomes uh, downloaded from RefSec. The time is around uh, uh, 90 minutes, so uh, an hour and a half. And the good scaling we obtain is mostly because uh, we are merging, the number of merges um, is equal to this, uh, the number of inner nodes of this uh, binary tree. So is uh, around the number, uh, equal to the number of leaves. So the number of uh, uh, genomes that I'm trying to, to merge into a pangenome graph. So overall, um, and this is, uh, not executed in a cluster, it's on an eight core, uh, eight core machine. Um, and I can show you some example of, uh, of pan-genome graphs. So here, for example, I took uh, a set of 105 uh, Klebsiella pneumoniae chromosome, and I picked nine of them. Uh, so these are three of these strains on the average pairwise divergence on the core genome is around 0.5%, so around the five SNPs per kilobase pair. Uh, and I picked nine of these of these strains on the tree. So here are uh, signal with crosses. Uh, using PanGraph, I can export my my pangenome graph into uh, a dot GFA format that can be opened and explored with Bandage. And this is a graphical representation of the of the graph. So you see in uh, so here the color indicates uh, whether uh, a block is. Uh, common to every of these strain, in which case is colored in red, or um, belongs to only some of these strain or paths, in which case it's, it's uh, some, some darker shade black or, or darker shade of red. So you see there are stretches of um, synthetic uh, regions, and then you have regions in which you have some diversity uh, between, between the paths. And one can look at the distribution of uh, length of these blocks. So here, for example, if you look at the, uh, at the blue distribution, this is a cumulative distribution of block length. You see that in total for these nine strains, um, I'm considering genomes that are around the five megabase pairs long. Um, I have around 1,200 uh, blocks. And half of them are bigger than uh, a kilobase pair. And, but one, many of these blocks are actually short. So if I weight this distribution by block length, giving more, more weight to blocks that are longer, actually I see that if I look at the total amount of sequence in my graph, then more than half of it is present on blocks that are uh, around two kilo, 20 kilobase pair long. Um, I can also look at the frequency of blocks. So for every block, I can check on how many strains this is present. Um, so blocks that are present in only one strain will be kind of private accessory blocks, while blocks that are present in all of the nine strains will be uh, core blocks. And again, if I weight blocks by length, so the red, uh, the red curve, I see that I have um, that most of the sequence is either in very private blocks uh, that are uh, present in only one strain or in conserved blocks that are, um, that are common to every strain. So again, this is a cumulative distribution. Um, and if I look at the, um, at the distribution of block length versus block frequency, I see that uh, many of, the, of these uh, accessory blocks that are present in only one strain are potentially very short or of uh, intermediate length. And then it, the, instead the, um, the core blocks have a higher average length with around 10 kilobase per long. And I can also ask what happens if um, instead of these nine strains, I take all of the 105 strains in this tree. 
So in this case, the uh, graph looks much more messy because obviously it's, it's more fragmented. But uh, if I look at the distribution of block length and block frequency, it, it still shows very good uh, properties. So uh, again, most of the sequence, it's in blocks that are around uh, 10 kilobase per long. So I, the number of strain has been multiplied basically by 10, but the average length of uh, of, um, of blocks, if weighted by length, has been basically divided by two. And I see this very common pattern of um, bimodal uh, frequency of blocks. They're either very common, core, or they're very rare, uh, present in very few strains. And if I look at the average size of a single chromosome, so a single of the strains that, that, I'm, that I'm trying to include in this graph, uh, I see this, this has, has a size that is comparable to the total size of the graph. Especially if I look in this case, I have 105 chromosomes, uh, each one around uh, five megabase per long, and the total pungenome genome graph size is around double of, of this size. So this is a good uh, compressed representation for this set of strains. Um, one last thing that I can tell you about Pangraph is that another, um, another uh, command that one can use is the marginalized command that is used to project the graph on a subset of strains. So let's say that I have a complex graph, but I'm only interested in the difference between uh, maybe a couple of strains, strain A and strain B. So I don't want to, um, I, I don't want to keep the complexity uh, of regions that are uh, in which the two strains behave the same. So I can basically project the graph on only these two strains. And this will basically highlight differences um, between, uh, between these two strains. Just to give you an example, again, I can take the, the pan graph that uh, um, was produced by, by the nine uh, Klebsiella strains that I, that I showed you before. And I can marginalize it over two particular uh, strains with a marginalized comment. And what I obtain is a much more uh, simple graph with only one point of contact. So you see local, uh, in black, you see local diversity between the two strains and in, uh, in red, the parts that are common. And if one looks into why uh, this pinching point is present, it's really because uh, these two strains have um, a big inversion. So actually what is happening is that um, one path will kind of perform an eight shape while the other path will remain outside. So this is why I have this, this pinching point in the middle. Uh, yeah, this is uh, roughly everything I wanted to, to tell you about this tool. Um, we have a preprint out on, uh, on BioArchive um, and we are currently working on, uh, on polishing and in improving the tool. Version 0 0.5 has been uh, released three days ago and we are currently under active development. So um, we are currently working on adding another alignment uh, kernel uh, inside of Pangraph because uh, uh, we have some limitation on the diversity of sequences that, that we can align. So we are working on um, overcoming this limitation. Then we're also working on making uh, installation a bit simpler and still uh, uh, catching bugs and, uh, and trying to make sure that everything run, runs smoothly. Um, and at the same time, we are, we are um, working, uh, trying to apply this, this tool to study the, the evolution of, uh, of bacterial pangenome. And yeah, we're um, very excited to hear what, uh, if, if you have the occasion to try it, what, uh, what you think about it. And, uh, yeah, we hope that you will find it uh, exciting and useful. Uh, thank you very much. So yeah, I want to really most of uh, um, the, the hard, hard work of um, coding the tool has been done by Nick uh, under the supervision of, of Richard. And also I want to thank Liam, who's, uh, who's gonna talk later and uh, who's been uh, here visiting us in, in Basel and uh, contributed with a lot of, uh, of useful discussion. And thanks to the organizer for uh, for having me. And yeah, I'll, I'll take questions or uh, if there's time. Yeah, that was a fantastic talk. Thank you so much. It was really interesting. And uh, that's a subject a lot of people have been working on for a while. And it's the first time I've seen something quite interesting that's quite new that really deals with like the whole genome problem. So uh, thanks very much. Um, thanks. I. Uh, 
I'm going to squeeze in one question here from Olivia. Uh, let me read it out so everyone can hear it. Um, very nice explanation of your tool. Very nice tool to see large rearrangements in the genomes. Do you find the bimodal block frequency pattern in other species uh, that you also found in Klebsiella? And also, did you look at the blocks that were causing the bimodal patterns? Is it coming from certain types of genes or mobile elements? So we did look at other species um, and we do find this pattern also in other species. So I only showed you here an example, but, uh, but the pattern seems to be, um, seems to be consistent. And uh, we, can, we can also match it with the, with the same frequency of genes. So we can check that actually the frequency distribution of blocks matches the frequency distribution of, of gene clusters. Uh, and indeed it does up to a certain uh, threshold of divergence. So things that are too diverged will currently not be merged. We are talking about uh, around 5% divergence will currently not be merged. And uh, yeah, we are in the process of, of looking at these uh, disordered regions and try to see if uh, we, can, uh, uh, we can impute this diverse diversity, local diversity to uh, mobile genetic elements or recombination hotspots. So we still don't have an answer on that, but yeah, it's, uh, we are also interested in trying to see if we can, if we can uh, come up with one, yeah. verify if really it's, uh, there are some causes to this local diversity. And, and can I squeeze a small question? You talk about the limitations in terms of um, uh, the sort of sequence diversity at the bits that do align, and I guess driven by the mapper. Um, are there limitations uh, in terms of like how much of the sequence of the genome can align, so uh, is it will it still work okay if it's heavily rearranged, or if you've only got so it's, say forty percent alignment between the genomes? So it will it will still merge uh, regions that are homologous. Mm -hmm. If all regions are more than five percent diverged, it will basically. Um, so maybe I can show an example. Well, that, that's fine. I, I was less worried about the divergence in the aligned bits as the proportion that was not aligned. Yeah, the proportion that is homologous will, will still merge and the rest will be isolate loops that, okay. that will be outside. Okay, well, thank you very much. Um, thank if you. If have got further uh, questions, we might bring them up in the discussion later. People- I'll be here, uh, could, yeah. Great. And if people could please feel free to add questions to the chat, which we, uh, oops, sorry, which we can save for later if, if, um, to bring up in the discussion. So um, thank you for that. And time to move on to the next talk. Um, so, oh, wait a minute. Alice, has, has Rowan Meta stepped out? I was about to invite. Um, yes. Yes, so oh, sorry. The next. So I'll move straight to Julian Paganini, uh, who's going to be talking about an optimized short read approach to predict and reconstruct antibiotic resistance plasmids in E. coli. Julian, Hi guys, 